Televiziunea Română, întâlnirile JTI și Fundația Art Production vă recomandă garantat 100%. Bine v-am regăsit la Garantat 100%. Invitatul nostru din seara asta s-a născut în 1961 la Palermo. Este medic psihiatru și neurobiolog specializat în dependență și boli psihiatrice. Este fondatorul unui centru de cercetări neurologice la Bordeaux, pe care l-a condus până la sfârșitul anului 2017. A primit marele premiu INSERN pentru toate cercetările sale privind mecanismele fiziopatologice ale bolilor psihiatrice și marele premiu la Monica pentru neurologie de la Academia de Științe a Franței. Este un eminent om de știință cu o activitate extrem de bogată. În momentul de față, invitatul nostru este directorul de cercetare al Institutului Național de Sănătate și Cercetări Medicale din Franța. De curând, cartea sa, Homo Biologicus, cu subtitlul Cum explică biologia natura umană, a fost publicată la editura Humanitas, iar traducerea în limba română e semnată de Ines Simionescu. E o carte excepțională. Um, unii ar spune că e o carte revoluționară. Dar ca orice carte revoluționară, face afirmații radicale. În cazul afirmațiilor radicale, evident că există și răspunsuri pe măsură. Însă condiția unică pentru a spune ceva în favoarea sau împotriva acestei cărți, este să citim această carte. Și vă asigur că experiența citirii acestei cărți este una absolut minunată. Le mulțumim prietenilor de la Editora Humanitas pentru mijlocirea acestui interviu. Doamne și domnilor, este o onoare să-i spunem bun venit la Garantat 100% domnului doctor Pierre Vincenzo Piazza. Bună seara! 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 No, I'm very honored to be here and very grateful to, for this invitation, the opportunity to have this discussion about this book. Thank you so much. The book is more than challenging. Um, I take the responsibility of saying that the book is revolutionary, that it's <laughs> unique by what it's saying. And I will begin with your kind permission with the central theory of your book, yeah. which is a hard one. You say that There's no mind, there's no soul as we knew it. Something immaterial, something energetic, something that leaves our body when we die. Something that is an entity separated from our biology. Something quite hard to explain, as people have been trying to do this for thousands of years. You say that our soul is our biology. You will get on the nerves of many readers. Oh. You will get on the nerves <laughs> of many viewers. Yeah, I know. Actually, I try to don't say exactly that. Because I think that um, there have been a lot of people that have tried to make that statement. Mm -hmm. That statement is a statement impossible to make. There is nothing, I mean, if... If you try to say there is no soul, there is not a material mind, you cannot prove it that there is no soul or immaterial mind. So what I've tried to do is mixing up an historical and biological perspective to say that we don't need to do the hypothesis that there is an immaterial part of our being to explain what we are. That is a slightly different proposition mm -hmm. in the sense you can believe that there is an immaterial soul. For example, I am a big fan of the immaterial soul. I would really like it to exist because I would like to continue after my biological body is dead. But I don't use it to make decisions. So there is a difference between belief and what we use mm -hmm. to make decisions in our everyday life. So where I have a position is kind of strong, 
is that I say that we don't need to make that hypothesis to explain ourselves, and especially we don't need to follow that idea to make decisions in our, our everyday life. It's a little bit like, like saying, I mean, no one can criticize anyone to betting on a lottery. Playing lotto, you have a very small chance of winning. So I have no problem with that. And that is what I consider a belief. A belief is something that has a very small chance of existing, but you can take it on. I mean, you can believe me. On the contrary, if because I played a lot, I start buying a castle, a Ferrari, quitting my job, and making a lot of decisions, then that is insane. And it's exactly the point I'm trying to make. We make a lot of decisions and we say a lot of bad things that happen mm -hmm. because people believe they have an immaterial soul. So, Dr. Piazza, do we have a soul? The human being has a soul. Or if you look around more precisely, let me ask you in a different way. If you look no. around these days, what do you think about human nature? Well, I think human nature is largely explained by biology, even in these days. And again, I don't know if we have a soul or not. What, I, what I've tried to do in the book is to try to understand why we have come up with the idea that we have an immaterial soul. <laughs> because no one has ever seen it. Of every few people can pretend to have seen it, but it's one of the major and more widely spread belief. If you, go in, if you take all the religion, or the humanities and human science, practically everyone believe that we have an immaterial source. So why is that? If, and the major reason is that when we, I mean, human beings don't like to don't have explanations. When we see a phenomenon, we want to explain it. Yes. And when we see a, the feeling that we have of ourselves and either what we didn't know before or what we have known about biology up to the 20th century, that cannot explain the, the human nature. So I would say up to the end of the 20th century or mid 20th century, making the hypothesis that we had an immaterial soul was absolutely justified. But then, we have discovered that biology is not what we thought it was. And where the problem, and the reason why I've written this book is because this discovery in biology is not like the major discovery in physics. With, with one sentence, you can explain that we have, uh, I don't know, we, we know that there is a, a quantum reality. It's, it's not like that is make of little bit and pieces that you have to put together and see the big picture to understand that biology basically <laughs> is very different from what we have learned in school. And I mean, where, what I have learned in school, what you have learned in school, I think what most of our audience have learned in school. Because you what have the perspective, Dr. Piazza, and you mm -hmm. express it um, like this. You say that you prefer to pretend or to be, as a matter of fact, an extraterrestrial coming on Earth and observing <laughs> human being from yeah. outside what yeah. we understand yeah. by the human being. I, I mean, the, 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 this is something that I always uh, try to teach my students is a very good perspective to, for understanding things, is to pretend to be an extraterrestrial that just arrived on Earth and just look around. And put a distance so, in between. Yeah, yeah, distance. And also this allowed to don't take anything for given. Uh, for example, we spend a lot of money on entertainment sport. I mean, if an extraterrestrial come on, 
our planet has to identify the major building in all culture, that will be stadium. And what this will tell about us, if you should evaluate our culture by the people that we pay more, the most, that's our actors and foot, uh, people that play football or other sports. So, and we consider that normal because we have grown with that. But if you take a step back, there are a lot of surprising things the humans do mm -hmm. and that we accept without trying to trying to explain that. So we, this is what I would try to do in my book. We will get there. I have a special question about that. But at a certain moment, you say, for the brain, our experiences yeah. are nothing else than biological events. Please exactly. explain that. I would like to do an example. Take a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yes. Okay. Before he starts doing bodybuilding and after. And I actually see the two pictures. So forget that they maybe he took some steroid or stuff. Imagine that it's natural. Yep. The, the body of this guy is completely different between before and after this intensive training. Right. And what is the difference between these two completely biologically different body, this. Yep. He has done exercise. So ex we know that experience can structurally modify biology. And if the muscles are good in modify adapting their biology to experience, the brain is the world champion in doing that. Because the ba the brain need few milliseconds, a few seconds, a few minutes to profoundly change its biology to record experience. So the brain, what is the the reason why I hope some of your viewer will be able to remember this interview, is because their brain has changed, and so what's Everyone should be aware that just watching us is changing their brain, is changing the brain permanently. It's the biology of the brain that changes. And so the neuron, depending on the experience of your life, you have neurons that have different co uh, configuration, different shape, different connection. And most of the biology of the brain is designed to do that. So. At a certain moment, you say something very hard, which is in this direction. And you say, biology is the one who, by keeping the past in present, allowed us to invent the word history. Yeah. Lots of people will be desperate when they will read this. I'm saying that biology, by allowing to record the past, has allowed to invent the word history because very simply if you cannot recollect the past you cannot build up a history and that is as real as it can get because i can give you certain drugs block the ability of your brain to record the experience mm -hmm. and you will be like in this movie the uh, perpetual sunshine of the spotless mind yes. in which you Forget you start over all over again, and history cannot exist. And you say, no, history is real because history is the results of the soul, the results of the mind, the results of soul, mind. Can't anyone give me two or three examples that they are real? They are belief. They are explanation that we have come up to explain, for example, the fact that uh, we have a sensation of ourselves that is ever changing. Another reason is that we seek freedom and we see biology as something very determined and fixed. So biology is not ever changing and Biology don't seek freedom. So the first two parts I've tried to do in my book is to explain that biology is even more changing 
that the idea that we have of the mind as a changing thing, by by all this ever changing, so is at all the level is something that always evolve and adapt. Please explain one of my viewers, which is desperate at this very moment, and mm -hmm. he or she might believe that Dr. Piazza is saying that we are empty, that we are only biology. Aren't we so poor with only biology? And aren't we so poor without a soul, without any material soul? So, so I, I, I completely, this is why I wrote, wrote this book. I don't know, I've been success, successful. It's true that if your viewer, except if he's a scientist, I, I'm making the assumption that your viewer is not a biologist. Yes. Someone very smart, very clever, but does not study biology at the university, it's not a biologist. So your viewers, what your viewers know biology, know what has learned in school. And what we have learned in school, clearly, if I tell you that what you have learned in school about biology, biology is determined by genes, that determine specific protein, right that I have a specific effect, okay? And if I have to say that me, I am that, I would be very disappointed. So I share the sentiment of your viewer. The fact is that we have recently discovered that biology don't work like that at all. So biology, when you know it, is much more fascinating mystic, I would say. At a certain moment, I thought to call this book Mystic Biology, because actually, biology has a beauty, a richness that defy imagination. What we like is to be able to imagine ourselves without limits, ever reaching, and that's biology. Biology is so incredibly diverse and I, I mean biology can do things that we have trouble even verbalizing i will ask a direct question a simple one and a very direct one yeah, can please. biology produce ideals aspirations i i, I think yes i've tried to show at, at least it can produce major cultural tendency, like being a conservative or a progressist, uh, like being a reactionary or a, uh, or a revolutionary. I think that can be determined by biology. Because again, biology is so complex and has been developed over such a long period of time that has designed actually different type of human beings that are more or less adapted to different situations. So I think, yes, biology, and I try to explain this, can explain major cultural movement of our society. And, uh, and also, when you think about that, Biology could also move us forward <laughs> because can make us understand this strange phenomenon that basically when you look at history, you have a bunch of the largest part of the population that it kindly kind of manipulated mm -hmm. by extremists of different board. And the reason is because the e extremists of different board they have extreme biology and cannot adapt in all types of society. And the, most of us can adapt in all types of society. And this is why the, most, of, most people can endure very different types of regimes because most people can adapt to different cultural settings while there are a smaller number of people that cannot because they have an extreme biology. They have been very useful during evolution 
because something that we have to understand is that our society in evolutionary term do not exist it's too short mm -hmm. evolution is something that takes millions of years yes our society is few hundred of years but even if you take uh, from i don't know the pharaoh to today's few thousand of years that is nothing in terms of evolution so to understand certain behavior that we have today we have to look at them how they would play in a situation where we were not controlling our environment because the major difference from today and prehistoric time mm -hmm. is control on the environment that we have dr piazza so, i will be very trivial in this very moment there yeah. is, it is very possible for a person to say um, if i am my bi biology then i can hide myself behind biology and i can say i can be a complete asshole an idiot a terrorist a criminal but it's not me it's my biology okay so the the, the fact is that does the fact that biology determine everything is a way to say that we are not responsible okay no <laughs> the answer is no because this would be the case with the old biology, with the biology in which everything was determined by the genes mm -hmm. and not determined by what we do and the choice we do. So something, a concept that uh, the book tried to uh, introduce is that the major function of biology actually is to give us freedom. So wow. biology is designed to make us free. All biology from the beginning, and this from the first bacteria that does that life, because biology equals life, life is a fight for freedom. Do you understand that a, an untrained person in biology finds yeah. this very difficult to understand? No. I hope that reading the book, they will find it easy to understand. <laughs> I, I think that the statement is extremely surprising. It is. This is why I wrote the book, because I knew that when with my friends, with anyone, I would say that biology, the major goal of biology is to make us free, and that biology has developed as a fight for freedom, everyone would look and me like I was going crazy or something. So <laughs> I know it's a very surprising statement. It is. But it is because in physical term, life is a aberrant state. It's an aberrant state because life is an, is an ensemble of things that are that have a very high level of order. Okay, so what our biology has to do is to keep this order high, because if doesn't not, if we don't keep this order high, well, we die. The fact is that the only uh, group of material things that they have tried to increase the order mm -hmm. are uh, alive beings. All the rest, there is something is called the second principle of thermodynamics. It's, I know it's like a bad word. People are afraid of thermodynamics. I, actually, everybody is afraid be, of thermodynamics. Yeah, actually, this is another example that people are not afraid of the right things. Because if there is something very simple, it's thermodynamics. Then in physics, you have things that are extremely complex. The second principle of thermodynamics just say that everything goes from order to disorder. And that going back is impossible. Mm -hmm. And it is. So if you have a group of elements that are that try to keep a high level of order, the only way of doing that is to increase the disorder in the environment. 
a very simple example. Life cannot exist separated by the environment. Take a cat, put it under a glass, uh, uh, separate it, like a, a, how you call it, uh, a glass bell yep. that isolates it. In a few minutes, the cat died. Why? What, what, why if we separate the, the cat from the environment, the cat died? The cat died because he cannot increase the disorder around him. And if he's isolated, the only thing that can get disorder is itself. And so he died because- If it's not Schrodinger's cat. Yeah, that's, that's a nasty cat. That cat, that, that cat you are talking about is a very nasty cat. Yeah, <laughs> but even, he, he, even the, that cat, once he's dead, I, I, I want to tackle this in my book, and then, then I decided to, to don't do it for several reasons, but the, 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 the idea is that the cat can be always, always is a dead or a live state, okay? And that's true, but I'm not sure that once the cat is dead, without an external apport of energy, it can become alive again, mm -hmm. simply because it should reverse the en its entropy, and that's not feasible. So yeah. I, I, I'm not sure that that the the, 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 the cat is really. I don't like that cat. I love cats. <laughs> it's a nasty cat. Okay. It's a nasty cat. You have an example which is shocking, impressive, and shocking when you say that we don't have an immaterial soul. And your example is very simple. Yeah. If you take a drug, the drug addresses itself to your physical body, to your yeah. biology. Mm. It cannot move to another state. No. which is inexistent. Yeah. That is a fascinating example. Please elaborate a little bit uh, on that. Many of my colleagues that are sociologists or philosophers, they have made parascientific argument that there was an immaterial mind. An immaterial, they don't call it the soul. The soul is more a religious yes. uh, definition. They call it the mind. mind. Okay? And in that case, they have to explain to me the dimensional transmutation of Brodzak or of, uh, I don't know, Lexomy, I don't know how you call it, uh, anxiolytics. Yes. And an anxiolytic is a very precise material molecule. You and me, if we have a little bit of the equipment, we can produce it in our garage, if you want. So it's something the most, basically material. So if our fear, emotion are mediated by the mind, how can a molecule that this the most material thing that is possible to modify it? To do that, it has to transmutate from one dimension to another. Yes. And so either we do this hypothesis of transdimensional mutation of that, or it's just very surprising that I can modify emotion, thought, even belief with just a physical molecules. So the mind in my view, is just what you call, is something that is produced by the brain, but not necessarily identical to the brain. This is another very important concept of modern biology, is that the producer is never identical to the product even in biology, even in protein. I mean, a protein, that, let's say that you have 
everything has a structure and a function. You have a body, you have a subtle, but you have a function. It's your job, it's the way you interact with your friends. Mm -hmm. You have a social function, okay? So you have a structure and a function. Everything in biology is like that. The only fact is the function is not identical to the structure. We could imagine that you with the same you, the same physical, mm -hmm. with different experience could have done a very different job. Your brain would be different. This is why you would be doing a different job. With biology, it's even more profound. Thing, the function is not determined by the structure. By what is determined the function? Is by the context. And what is the context? Is the experience of the person. So, thought, ideas, what we call general thinking, spirit, it is biology. mind, everything is biology. But this we know since a lot, I would say we know this at least uh, since 20 years, 20, 30 years. That's, that's clear. I mean, thought, mind, everything. If I block the functioning of, functioning of your brain, do not exist anymore. And we can do on, off. Please let me invite you um, in a challenging act, which is talking about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, okay? Yeah. Um, but seriously, let's think yeah. about sports and the enthusiasm uh, when we are in the stadium. Let's think about theater, film, visual arts, music, all things overtaking aesthetics and producing deep emotions and a special uplifting feeling, even a certain type of revelation. Sometimes we will say, this was a revelation. How can okay. all this be felt, achieved, received with such a high degree of intensity in the absence of an immaterial soul? Uh, in the sense, okay, again, we can explain all you have described just with biology. We don't need any material soul to explain all that. Because what you are doing, basically, you are raising one major question is why we like or why we love what, what we love. Yes. It's the reason of pleasure. Okay. And this is a, being a very complex uh, concept. And uh, the, or there is a theory about this in the book. And uh, to Try to explain this is we have to go back something like 50,000 years in time when something happened to our brain and this mutation or multiple mutation has made humans completely different from other animals or other uh, living things. So it's what is called the cognitive re revolution. But yes. we could also call it the pleasure revolution. Because something that we have immediately learned is to separate pleasure from the original evolutionary reason why there is pleasure. Mm -hmm. I mean, animals have pleasure, but they have pleasure only when they perform act that facilitate their survival or the survival of the species. And we have been able to realize that certain activity gives pleasure. And we are the only species that spend most of its time seeking pleasure in itself. Yes. And what gives pleasure are sports is something that they give pleasure is to go away from equilibrium. So the complexity, and the whole complexity of pleasure is biology. Yeah, yeah, because basically happiness, basically happiness and pleasure, they have two very different biology. At the end of the day is what determines a lot of bit of society. Happiness is to keep equilibrium is is this 
sensation of fullness when you are in an equilibrated state. And this pleasure is, yep. is the opposite. It's what you try to, and what you get when you go away from equilibrium. And why we have these two very different um, type of hedonism, mm -hmm. happiness and pleasure, is because if your major hedonic dimension is happiness, mm. you are extremely well adapted when there is a lot to it. Dr. Piazza, we still have one minute. Please, yeah. in this minute, please explain this fundamental saying in your book, which is, quote, biology gives meaning to life, end of quotation. Yeah, because I think that one of the major problems of our uh, society is that a lot of people have gone away from, I would say, old belief. I think that biology, because of its richness and its explicative power, because it can explain a lot of things, can create a new belief system that instead of being an hypothesis, is true. And this is why I think biology can give meaning to life. Because again, if you read my book, you will discover that biology is much more fulfilling, mystical, mm -hmm. and uh, satisfying than all the other belief systems. So not only that we are not poorer without an immaterial soul, but we are richer through our biology. And, uh, and we are richer and we could probably change things finally. Because something that look at our at our mother in history we had period in which we have completely revolutionary society. But I would say that modern society in the last uh, I don't know even thousand of years, we have done this. We have changed, go back change, go back, and look at the war. We have started again. I mean, it's completely insane what is happening. Yep. But some place is not surprising. <laughs> if you look, we had the illusion that we had changed. And actually, we have not. Maybe we have not changed because we don't have a belief system that allow us to change because we can take it as true, we can believe in it. And because it's true, we can evolve with it. If I try to make you change your life, telling things that we are not sure that are real, is much more difficult that if we ground ourselves in something the real. So biology so, is even more complex than we can imagine in our excellent. more complex thoughts. Yeah, and, and I, I would say that biology allow not to say that the soul do not exist, but allow to incarnate the soul, allow to make the soul real. So modern biology is just the materialization of the soul, it's not denying that the soul exists. Thank you so much for accepting this interview. I will say a few words in Romanian and then I'll come back to you. Yeah, no problem. Um, recomand cu foarte mare căldură, e o mare experiență să citiți această carte, Homo Biologicus, cu subtitlul Cum explică biologia natura umană. E o carte publicată la editura Humanitas în traducerea uh, semnată de Ines Simionescu. Le mulțumesc prietenilor de la editura Humanitas pentru mijlocirea acestui interviu. Dr. Piazza, thank you so much for accepting this interview and thank you for this fascinating book. Thank you, thank you, thank you for liking the book, thank you for inviting me and thank you for the conversation. It's been really very nice talking to you. Thank you so much and good luck with everything that you do. Thank you. Bună seara. Bye. Tuturor celor care sunt alături de garantat 100%, mulțumim frumos pentru încredere. Ne vedem duminica viitoare. Noapte bună.